But thank you all so much for joining us for Inside the Library Land Project, what I learned from visiting more than 400 public libraries. I, I took a little, um, uh, I sort of, I put my own twist on the title there, Greg. Uh, do you love libraries? Greg Peveril Conti of the Library Land Project does too. Greg has visited over 400 libraries across the United States, including some of the, one, the ones nearby, uh, Bill Ricca, Chumsford, North Reading, Tewksbury, Wilmington, and Woburn. So join us for a fun presentation highlighting some of the great work done by public libraries today and how library services are positively impacting communities around the country. In addition to being executive director and co-founder of the Library Land Project, Greg serves as an information services librarian at the Wellesley Free Library, a substitute reference librarian at the Framingham Public Library, and a trustee at the Medway Public Library. That's like the, that's like a that's the hat trick there, Greg. Um, and again, want to thank the uh, friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring and the libraries in Andover, Billerica, North Reading, Wilmington, and Woburn for helping spread the word. Uh, so all 50 of us or so who are watching live and the other 100 plus that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Greg for joining us here tonight. And Greg, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Robert. And thank you everyone for joining me tonight and allowing me to share stories of some of my travels around library land. I do want to uh, just clarify one thing. I'm actually no longer, oh no, that's not true. I have one shift left as a sub in Framingham, and I'm now actually a, a full-time librarian at Wellesley. So what I'd like to do tonight is share some of our travels, uh, a little bit about the mission of Library Land, a little background on myself and how this all happened, uh, talk about what I look at when I look at libraries, and then uh, the wonders never cease. I want to be able to tell you about some of those things I look at in the context of libraries that I visited. Um, Library Land's mission is, is pretty simple. Uh, we're a 501c3, and our goal is to explore, document, and promote the essential role that public libraries play in our communities. And having seen hundreds of public libraries in communities large and small, I've really had a chance to see the impact that they can have. This is an old picture of me from February. Uh, let me say up front that this was not something that I anticipated. Uh, in 2017, I was working at a public relations agency. I'd had a long career in PR and I, I'd enjoyed it and uh, imagined continuing indefinitely. Uh, but in 2017, I decided to start my own agency. And uh, with a friend, we started a company and we needed a place to work. And as is the case for so many entrepreneurs, we decided to go to our local public library. Um, at the time I lived in Newton, my colleague lived in Arlington, we met at Newton and had a terrific time. We decided to do it again. And we decided the next time to go to a different library. And we went to Waltham. Newton to Waltham is a very very different communities, different libraries, uh, different experiences. Uh, we went to Weston then, and then to Wellesley. We cleared all the W's. Uh, and along the way, we started noticing little differences and we started keeping informal score. Uh, after maybe a dozen, we thought it would be really fun to go to all the libraries in Massachusetts. Uh, and so over the course of 2018, we went to 100 public libraries. In 2019, we had spoken to uh, the library director at the Plymouth Library, Jen Harris, who suggested that we come to a library legislative day and share our, our love of libraries with legislatures and their aides. And so we decided to use that day to launch library land. Uh, you know, we'd been collecting information for a while. We didn't know what to do with it, but we decided we'll put a website out. We'll, we'll start sharing our stories because we're PR people. 
we started talking to the media and it was actually a pretty easy story to sell to reporters. Uh, you know, there were two goofballs trying to go to all the libraries in the state. Uh, but when we got media's attention, what we told them was that people don't understand what public libraries do. They, they have a, a really antiquated image of libraries as sepia-toned museums of books. And we realized that's not the case. And so for Boston Magazine, we told them just how amazing libraries were. When we talked to uh, Jim and Marjorie uh, at WGBH, we talked about how fun it was to do this, but how integral and important public libraries are. Uh, in 2019, Library Journal wrote a story about us, and we suddenly started hearing from libraries around the country. And so we decided, oh, we should, we should see some of those too. Uh, just a quick clarification on the map that you see, orange is my favorite color. And so the orange dots are the libraries I've been to. The blue dots are Massachusetts libraries I've yet to see. Now at the end of 2020, or at the end of 2019, we started hearing from libraries in other parts of the country, inviting us to come and speak, to see their libraries, to write about them. As 2019 started, 2020 started, I was working as an on-call librarian at the Dover Town Library. I thought this was gonna be the best year ever. Um, it was in some ways, but it was a hard one. Now, having seen so many libraries, a natural question people ask is, what is your favorite library? And that is never a simple question to answer because libraries come uh, in so many shapes and sizes to serve so many different kinds of communities. So I'd like to tell you about two libraries at opposite ends of the spectrum, both of which are among my favorites. The first is the Boston Public Library. And it is a reminder of how lucky we are here in Massachusetts. By some measures, this is the second largest library in the country after the Library of Congress in terms of the size and scope of its collection. For more than a century, the library has continued to evolve and to meet the changing needs of the people. It has partnerships with organizations across the city from WGBH to the, to the MBTA, where just recently they were announcing, they announced uh, free eBooks with QR codes to make it available for people who are commuting. It has services for students, for business people, for families and more. It is just an incredible place. At the opposite end of the spectrum, and one that's really dear to me, is the Garden Grove Public Library in Iowa. This is a rural library. The town has only 174 people. Uh, although technically it's a city, they have a mayor. Uh, the picture here is Sarah Christensen. She and her husband moved from the Pacific Northwest to Garden Grove to live and celebrate 19th century prairie life. When I walked into this library, Sarah greeted me wearing the clothes you see there. She made them herself. Uh, she is an author who writes about 19th century prairie life. When they got to Garden Grove, her husband, Gabrielle, who is a librarian at the Des Moines Public Library, uh, she started spending time at the library. It's just down the street from her house. Um, a librarian at the time uh, would sit and watch graphic war documentaries. There was no shelving system. There was no catalog. There were no library cards. Uh, and Sarah slowly began making order of the chaos. Gab uh, Gabrielle helped her, giving her pointers and, and being on hand to provide an assist. Uh, and slowly, the two of them pulled this library back together. Uh, she was telling me about one of her first programs. Now, this is a town of 174 people. Her first program had 24 attendees. Think about how many people that is as a percent of the town and how important it is in a town that small that has no services, that has 
no entertainment, that has nothing. It is really, uh, it's really integral to the community and the, and the library and, uh, and, the, and the town itself. Uh, I was able to become library card holder number 21 at Garden Grove. And I still stay in touch with Sarah to hear how things are going. It's, uh, it's just an example uh, of how libraries of any size can meet the, the needs of the communities they serve. It's not a, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be a question of a wealthy library or an affluent community. Every library with the right spirit and guidance and leadership can make a real difference. And Garden Grove does that in a way that few others do. So those are two of my favorites. But as we drove around and as we thought about public libraries, uh, we, we started rating them. We kept, as I said, informal score. And I tracked things that mattered to me uh, as you know, a middle-aged white guy looking for a place to work. Over time, through my education and through exposure, I, I retired the rating system and moved to a framework that helps me think about libraries. And that's what I'd like to share with you. And I'm going to talk about these things with examples from some of the libraries that I've seen. Um, the first and natural place to start obviously is, is place. And that's the physical space of the library, both indoors and out. We look at the people, the interactions between the staff, between the staff and patrons, the diversity, the engagement, the excitement that the staff brings to their work in their community. We look at the collection, the natural, really the first reason most people come to the library. Um, what's available at the library itself, what's available through ILL, uh, interlibrary loan, <clears throat> what type of special collections there might be, if there's a library of things, those are all things that fall into that collections category. Uh, we look at programming. How diverse are the programs? How accessible are they? Uh, services, either delivered through the library or through partner organizations or the community. Uh, and finally, policies, which was something that I didn't even think about when I started this project. But as I've moved through the library world uh, more attentively, I've realized just how important they are. Oh, you're about to see pictures for those of you who said, I'm not seeing pictures. Um, so starting with places, libraries do come in every shape and size, in every style imaginable. And there is no one that's right for every community. Uh, earlier this week, I had a chance to visit uh, a few of the libraries who are represented tonight. Uh, on the left is the Flint Library in North Reading. All right, I, sorry, I'm just seeing some notes uh, in the chat. Um, a beautiful building. In the middle on the top is the Lincoln Library, which is, is among my favorites because it has a, uh, a local history room that's underground, that's climate controlled, where its lights are dimmable and where you can't get a cell signal. And so working in that library is always such an amazing treat. Uh, down below that is the Provincetown Public Library. It wasn't built as a library. It was, I, I think it probably started as a church and then it became a museum. And in its role as a museum, uh, the library, uh, well, a half size schooner was built in the library. Uh, and it's a super fun, thing to see. Uh, one of the things I like most about the Provincetown Library, uh, last year I was, uh, I sailed to Provincetown. And as you approach, I, there's the, the huge tower, but the second tallest building that you'll see as you approach is the library. And I, I just love that serving as a beacon. And on the right is the Andover Library, uh, the I suppose new entrance uh, that really to me is an inspirational uh, structure, just that, that glass towering up over you, so many stories. So the places and spaces of the exterior, they can tell you a lot about the library, but they don't tell half the story. You really need to, to step inside. But before you do, there's the outdoor spaces that are also really important. Uh, on the left 
is the library at Camden, Maine. And uh, it's a really funny library. When you approach it, there's a small building uh, on a large lawn. And there's a, a light tower, if you will, a small glass enclosure. Uh, when you go into the library, through its beautiful gardens, be through a beautiful amphitheater, uh, most of the library is underground. Uh, so they've managed to keep and preserve this amazing outdoor space that goes around, uh, around the building. In the center is the Wilmington Library. It's the reading garden there. And reading gardens are such a popular feature in libraries. I will say that uh, in my role as trustee and in working with libraries on their strategic plans and, and, and long range goals, Outdoor spaces are one of the most commonly asked for features that people want to see at public libraries. And with good reason, they, they really extend the space outdoors and create opportunities for other kinds of engagement and interactions. On the, on the right is the Andover Public Library, the beautiful roof patio. Uh, that was not there the last time I visited, uh, but it really is just a, a beautiful and uh, exciting space. So going into the library, thinking about it from what brought me to libraries in the first place, spaces to work. And this is something that more and more people, uh, I think both during COVID and, and afterward as people have been working from home, folks are looking for places where they can go and not be at home and still be productive. Uh, on, the, on the left are study rooms at the Wellesley Free Library. It's interesting, Wellesley had in the past five study rooms, three very small and, and two larger ones. Uh, during COVID, they renovated the library and one of the additions were these new study rooms uh, that are colorful, they're all glass, they are used from morning till night. Uh, and it really speaks to the need that the community has for those types of workspaces. In the middle, is the Flint Library, and I think uh, in, uh, in North Reading. And one of the things that's important when you think about libraries as workspaces is they're not just study rooms, but it's also access to public computers. It's access to scanners, to printers, to faxes. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I'm working on and I talk about a lot is helping libraries uh, rethink the fees they charge people for using technology. Um, particularly fax machines. It drives me crazy that we charge people to send faxes. Um, on the right is the Woburn Library. And uh, I was there for opening day and walked through and saw people's faces as they saw their new library and just the, the looks of, of joy, of astonishment, of just wonder. Um, and hearing the stories of, of this newly renovated antique building uh, and one of the things I loved the most was that each of the floors in the antique section is a different New England hardwood. Um, those had been buried under carpets for decades. Uh, they were restored, cleaned, uh, refinished, and just made absolutely beautiful. And going into that library, whether it's in the antique section or in the, the study rooms in the new section, it's such a productive place to spend time. I really have just enjoyed working there so much over, uh, over the years. Another important role for public libraries is, a, is as a place for people to socialize. Um, and that too is something that libraries are recognizing and are taking steps to address. Uh, the three here are all in Massachusetts. Uh, on the left is the Sherburn Public Library. Uh, that library was under construction for almost seven years. Uh, through a whole series of uh, supply chain issues and contractor issues, it, it opened up finally this spring and walking into it was, uh, was a real treat. Um, when I asked them the style, they said it was mid-century arts and crafts, which is something I wasn't familiar with, uh, but it's absolutely beautiful. And they built or created a bunch of social spaces um, a bunch of occasional setups like the one you see here. They also have two fireplaces. Uh, they were wood fireplaces years ago, 
And the former director told me that even not that many decades ago, they were using the fireplaces. They've now been replaced by gas fireplaces. And we're seeing that at more and more libraries uh, as people want to create um, a comfortable and cozy environment. In the middle, that is the Map Room Tea Lounge. It is a cocktail lounge at the Boston Public Library. And if you haven't had a chance to visit, I really recommend it. Um, I was one of the first people in line, had one of the first cocktails served. Um, we sat down and talked to uh, David Leonard, the president of the Boston Public Library to understand why, how did you come up with the idea? And he explained that the Boston Public Library, as is the case with many libraries, struggled to bring in millennials and young people. Uh, so the idea of a cocktail lounge came up. Uh, it's open a handful of days a week from about four o'clock till about six o'clock, and it worked. Uh, it has resulted in millennials coming in. Uh, yes, there is also the tea lounge, the, the, the tea room itself where you can get a tea serve, but the cocktail lounge was uh, the really outstanding innovative part uh, of socialist spaces that we've seen. Uh, here at the Flint, you see on the right-hand side, another set of just uh, occasional seating to, to create that third space opportunity for people to come together. Um, it's been fascinating for me working in both Framingham and in Wellesley to see how much just casual social, social interaction takes place between patrons. Um, that's really uh, a heartening thing and something that uh, love to see and love to see libraries taking steps to foster that. Libraries are also places to be inspired. When I started this project, a friend of mine said, why? Like, why do you go to libraries? Why don't you just go to a coffee shop? And I showed him pictures of, of the inside of public libraries and said, you know, you can go to a Starbucks and they're comfortable places. I, you know, I have a, 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 a child who works in one, nothing against Starbucks. But when you walk into a space uh, like the one on the left, which is again from Woburn, I mean, that lifts your spirits. That, that makes you think lofty thoughts. And that's something the libraries do uh, in a way that other public spaces just can't. Uh, libraries also have that benefit of being one of the few public spaces where there's no expectation that you're going to spend money, that you're welcome to be there uh, just as you are and to use your imagination to use the space to its potential to meet your needs. I loved this, this mosaic mural uh, at the Andover Library. Uh, that just, to me, really talked about that idea of lift and inspiration that comes from libraries. And then on the right, you see the Reuben Hoare, uh, which was just opened in 2021, I believe, or maybe even 22, uh, in Littleton. And one of the things that they've done is make the outdoors part of the library experience with so much glass and so many windows uh, and so many just terrific vistas uh, that it, it's another example of how inspiration can come, not just from the physical structure, but from the library's place in the, in the wider world. Libraries are also places to, uh, to meet uh, to make and to create and explore. Um, we have seen tons of maker spaces and uh, the one on the, on the left is, uh, is one at Wilmington uh, where they've put it uh, as they're in the process of, of reorganizing and renovating and reimagining their first floor. Uh, they found a space for their 3D printer and makerspace activities. Um, love seeing that. In the center, uh, this is the Lawrence Library in Pepperell. And this is part of the library's collections, uh, collection of stuffed birds. Uh, it is about 140 specimens. I suppose I could have talked about this as a collection, uh, and it is, but it is a, a collection that just makes, creates conversation 
creates the desire to explore. Many of the species that are represented here no longer exist. Uh, and this library uh, has created a way to uh, enjoy, I suppose. The one on the right is Atherton. It's uh, in California. It's a very affluent community, one of the, one of the most affluent zip codes in the country. Uh, their 3D printer, um, what I liked about what they were doing there, we see 3D printers in a lot of libraries and a lot of times they're used to make, uh, you know, fun tchotchkes, um, small uh, toys. Uh, here, they were using it to make replacement parts for library items that had been uh, lost. Uh, I think they were actually making uh, pieces for a chess set that day. Uh, so it was really cool to see that creativity being and that, that maker idea being applied to a productive end for the library. The last part of places and spaces is the issue of sound in public libraries. Um, it's a controversial issue. Some people um, are in the, the silence is golden school of thought. And then at the other extreme, you have the library um, example where people are willing to shout across, um, including the staff in some places. Um, here on the left-hand side, we have uh, a sign from the West Des Moines Public Library, a warning to patrons that any conversations they have can be heard on the floor above them. Um, it's important to let people know that kind of thing. If, if you're a patron, and I can tell you from, from personal experience, both as a patron and, and as a librarian, people have conversations that they maybe shouldn't be having in the library or in public. Uh, and it's important to remind people that you're in public when you're at the library. On the right-hand side, that's the Boston Public Library. Those are Harry and the Potters. Uh, they are wizard rockers. And if you're not familiar with the wizard, wizard rock, uh, it's kind of homebrew music based around Harry Potter scenarios and characters. They play at a lot of libraries. This was outside the BPO, which was good because they were super loud. Um, but they've also played uh, indoors at libraries and they're super loud then as well. So once you've been through the library, you've come through the doors, you've been across the grounds, you've appreciated the outside, you've explored the spaces, the next thing you're most likely to do when you arrive at the library is engage with the staff. This was something that was really important to me as I traveled through libraries. How welcoming and engaging, how diverse, how approachable were people uh, at the libraries I was working with. And it's really helped inform my own work as a librarian. Um, there was a day in 2020 when things were starting to open, perhaps it was 21, and I went to a library that I won't name here in, uh, it was actually in CW Mars. And as soon as we walked in, we were told no photography. That's okay. Some libraries have policies, so no pictures. I started asking questions. How big is this town? What kind of people do you serve? What seemed to me to be pretty innocuous and, and, and normal questions. Um, I was told I needed to, to speak to the director, but the director wasn't there and the questions couldn't be answered. I left. I was pretty disheartened. I went to another library in CW Mars, and I will name this one, uh, and that was Charlton. And we arrived, and I went to the uh, welcome desk, as I always do, and said, hello, I've never been here before. And I started asking questions. And the librarian said, you're going to need to speak with our director. And I thought, oh my goodness, what's happened here? So she led me to the director. And the director said, do you want a tour? And I walked through the library with the director and she pointed out things. And when I came back in, after we'd gone outside uh, to their outdoor reading space for children. And when I came back in, the staff was there. And she said, we've been waiting for you. We knew who you were. We've wanted to see you. And to me, 
that feeling of being wanted and welcomed as a patron is something everyone who walks through the library doors should feel. Uh, when I see a patron, I just, well, I, I joke with people, one of the things I love about being a librarian is it's a, a carte blanche to talk to strangers. And that is, that's my vibe when I, when I deal with the public. Um, we also talk about people in terms of diversity. And I had an interesting experience um, at the West Link Public Library. Uh, it's a branch of the Wichita Public Library system. Um, I was there taking notes, working. And as I was getting ready to leave, I, I made a note that this was a LSW, library so white. And the reality is librarianship is a very white profession. And it's something that needs to be addressed in libraries and library programs and library schools and libraries need to be thinking about. Uh, so I said, this is not a very diverse library. And then as I walked out and I stopped at the, at the welcome desk to ask a question, uh, the librarian at the service point was deaf. Uh, and so our communication was through simple signs and writing. And it made me realize diversity can take a lot of different forms. Um, and it's important to try to recognize and appreciate all of them when you're engaging and experiencing a public library. So now we've met a friendly librarian. This is my colleague, Annette uh, in Wellesley, who is a super friendly, super welcoming librarian who I enjoy working with tremendously. So after you've done that, obviously you're gonna go and access the collection. Um, this is why people come to libraries. And what's wonderful about what constitutes a collection is just how wonderfully varied they can be. On the left, this is the archive of the Performing Arts Library at the New York Public Library. It is an immense library. It is, uh, I went because I wanted to see the, uh, they, they did an exhibit on Lou Reed uh, from the Velvet Underground that had been put together by his wife, Lori Anderson. And so I wanted to see that. And I went, and I will tell you, this library, which is at Lincoln Center in New York, is as big as Woburn. Uh, it is tremendous. There are tens of thousands of scores of sheet music, of librettos. Uh, all of it is accessible to explore and, uh, and enjoy. In the middle, this is the Monroe County Public Library in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, it is a chock-a-block full library. One of the things that, that you know, I think about when I think about collections that we're really lucky about here in Massachusetts is interlibrary loan uh, and how we can get almost anything within a couple of days from any library in the state. Uh, it is a tremendous resource. Uh, and it means that our libraries don't need to be completely jam-packed because we know that we can turn to a partner library and get materials. And so we can think about space in more creative ways to meet the more varied needs of the community. On the left hand, on the right hand side, that's uh, that's part of the map collection at the Oakland Public Library in Oakland, California. What was so cool about that is that each of those drawers contained dozens of maps. There were thousands of maps. Well, maybe not thousands, but hundreds. You could pull them out, use them, and enjoy them in a way that uh, that maybe more people should do. I I found that tool at Framingham where people would come in frequently wanting to see uh, historic maps of the town, uh, to see where their homes were. I, I spent uh, an hour with someone looking backwards through one map after another, after another, to the earliest maps from the 1640s, I believe, as seeing what his neighborhood was at all those different stages in the past. That's such a cool part of what a collection can be as a, as a, as a way to, to start a conversation. Uh, one of the coolest parts of the Oakland collection uh, was completely non-traditional. Uh, they have a collection of tools and bikes, uh, of scrapper bikes, uh, which is a, a, a subculture of, of DIY bike customizers in, in California, uh, where people of all ages can come in, learn how to maintain bikes, learn how to make these bikes and enjoy them together. Uh, 
it's a really cool example of a, a collection that goes beyond uh, what people generally think of. Another part of the library experience is programming. Um, it has been so much fun to see the different types of programs that libraries do. Uh, on the on the left, that's the Dover Town Library. That is uh, February twelfth, twenty twenty. I worked that night. There was a, a we had carnival. There were uh, musicians. It was so much fun. Uh, later that night, I got a call from the director saying, "Don't come in tomorrow. We're going to be closed for a couple of days." Um, that was the last time I worked there. Um, unfortunately. Uh, in the middle there, we see the program board at the uh, at Tewksbury. Uh, and I will say that all of you who are enjoying this program tonight, it is largely thanks to, to Robert's diligence and his creativity in pulling together programs and partnering with, with people um, to create and promote these types of programs. Um, such an asset to have that in the community. Thank you very much. Um, on the upper right hand, what you see there are salamander eggs. I, I, that was at the Stowe Library in Stowe, Mass. Uh, I was there doing a similar program. Uh, and a few days prior, I had come to walk through the library and talk to people. And there, the children's librarian walked in wearing Wellington boots uh, with a net over her shoulder and a five gallon bucket in her hand. Uh, she had been out collecting eggs and uh, it was super fun to see. They had a, a tank both of had of frogs and salamanders. I went back a week later, everything was bigger. Um, and it was really fun to hear how much the kids in the community had enjoyed uh, in this year and the years past that experience. At the bottom there, that's at, at, at Ellettsville, a branch of the Monroe County Public Library out in uh, Bloomington. And they probably had 400 puppets. Uh, it had started innocently enough uh, and just kept expanding and expanding and expanding. Um, they're now a central part of that library's programming, um, unexpectedly perhaps, but that's the way things go. And that's uh, one of the really wonderful things. One of the things I love about being a librarian now myself is the ability to do programs. Uh, both this program about travels through library land, uh, but I am also doing a program on connecting through conversation. As a librarian, to be able to just think of an idea, to have colleagues and administration and the community to support you in producing them, uh, it's, it's super fun. Uh, I, I wish more people took advantage of them. Next are the services that libraries offer. And, and these, they might be provided by the library directly. Oftentimes they're done in partnership with other organizations. Uh, sometimes they're provided by, by a third party. Uh, in Natick, on the left, you see a bookmobile uh, that would routinely go out to uh, a, a big apartment complex in the western part of the, the community and, and serve the needs of, of that a part of the town. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, bookmobiles getting back on the road. And, and it's it's really super to see. I, I saw one in uh, Cambridge, uh, Ohio, where there was one library for the county. Uh, the county had no movie theaters, no bowling alleys, no entertainment of any sort. And they did have a bookmobile. And the librarian said, this is this is it. We, we go out into uh, kind of rural communities, uh, kind of com hill communities, and we are we are the cultural connection. Um, that's a tremendous service. Another tremendous service by a rural library in the center there. Uh, I visited Rutland, and uh, it's in the very center of the state. It's a small town, under five thousand people, I think. They don't have library cards, and I asked, "How does that work?" And they said, "We know everybody here." So we don't need cards. But that little town of, of 5,000, they vaccinated more than 100,000 people during COVID. Uh, and it's a really 
just amazing example of how services come together. Uh, their fire chief, when the requirements for the COVID vaccine came out, said, we're going to get one of those freezers. We're going to be stockpiling those vaccines and we're going to be serving this community. And the library became the staging location. I've met people from all over central Massachusetts who went to Rutland uh, for their vaccinations. On the right, this was the first I had seen this. This is at the Hussey Mayfield Library uh, in Indiana. This is a nursing pod. Uh, I've talked to a lot of libraries, but how do you deal with, um, with nursing? Some have separate rooms. Some have, you can nurse wherever you are. Uh, at the Hussey Mayfield, they, they offered uh, this solution, which was the, the nursing pod. And I've seen it now at a few others. Um, it's a, a pretty cool recognition of, of this important need and a library finding ways to meet it. And finally, this policy. And as I said, when I started Library Land, I did not think about policy at all. I, to the extent that I did, I thought about what does it take for me to book a study room? Um, and I've come to recognize that it is so much more than that. Uh, on the left, that's the Milpitas Public Library in the Santa Clara uh, County Library System. Really love the ability to just with the QR code book your study room. Um, I will say that I've seen many different approaches to study rooms. Super important resource. No one seems to have cracked the code uh, to do study rooms easily and well. Someday someone might, but they all have their drawbacks. In the middle of this, Walpole. And I'll tell you a couple of things about Walpole that I really enjoyed. One, they recognized early on that people were going to use libraries as workspaces, and they created six beautiful glass study rooms. They also created a bunch of social spaces and felt the need to explain to people how spaces worked, that they are for everybody, and to be civil with one another, and to be considerate and appropriate given the scale of the building and the different uses. Uh, that you see there. On the, on the right, uh, that's at the Lawrence Library in Pepperell. Uh, the dog policy is that dogs must be on the leash. This is the director, Deb Spratt, who's actually one of Library Land's trustees and the smaller of her two dogs. Uh, I did some focus groups there uh, earlier this year, and the number of people who said that socializing their dogs was one of the main values they got out of the library, that people had been coming there for years and years because Deb has had her dogs there for years uh, and has made it part of the community. Uh, everyone knows her, her giant dogs. So those are the things that I look at. And I hope that they'll maybe help you think about public libraries, to look at the different elements, the experience of the space, the connection to the people, the resources that are available to you, the services that are offered both by the, the library and potentially the community uh, and others. I will say that at the Des Moines Public Library uh, back in 21, uh, once a week, they have social service agencies from all across the city come set up uh, almost a, a set of tables in the in, in a large public space uh, to meet the needs of folks who are coming to the library. People know that that's the day to come to get help with different issues. Uh, the library serves as that central uh, clearinghouse and third space for people to enjoy and also get what they need. Um, the library here on our checking out picture is uh, in Meredith, New Hampshire. I was there uh, it must have been May because it's early June now. Uh, that's a library that was renovated and expanded during COVID. Uh, it has just reinvigorated the relationship between the library and the community. And it's uh, it was an amazing library to see and also to talk to the staff and to patrons about how they how they were enjoying it. Uh, the the youth the young adult librarian it was her 
first, I, I think I think this might have been the second or third day the library was open, she had just started, was trying to get her heads around both the, the library space and how that space was going to be used by kids, the kids in the community. Um, it was a really exciting conversation. And it's you know just one example of, of the kinds of things you can have happen in a library. I, I encourage you, go and talk to your librarians. They will love to, to share with you. I'd also like to invite you to share uh, with me and with Libraryland. This QR code uh, takes you to four questions that we ask, uh, that we encourage people to think about, uh, and that we ask libraries to ask their patrons as they think about planning. Uh, and they're really four very simple questions. Uh, one is, what do you love about your library? And, um, and we hear things from uh, the building itself, the staff is one of the things most frequently cited by people. Uh, we ask people what they value the most. And we understand that what you love and what you value may be two different things. Um, you know, we hear about study spaces. We hear about opportunities for uh, enrichment. Uh, we hear about literacy programs and citizenship programs. Um, we ask what people wish the library understood about them. Um, it's hard sometimes to listen and get a, a really good picture of your patron base and the needs of your community. And so we ask. And then finally, uh, if there was one thing that you could change about the library, what would it be? Uh, and that has been uh, just a rife, uh, just a huge range of really wonderful suggestions that we hear from the public. You can follow Libraryland, and I hope you will. Um, the website is librarylandproject.org, and you can follow our travels there. You'll see uh, Libraryland Project on Instagram and on Facebook. You can reach me at info at librarylandproject.org. We love talking about libraries. I have rebuilt my life around public libraries. I don't encourage everyone to do that, but if the spirit moves you, Join me on travels through library land and getting to know and understand and enjoy your public libraries. Thank you very much. And now if folks have questions, I'm open. So folks, let's give Greg a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. And uh, let's uh, take uh, roughly 10 minutes of uh, questions and comments from the audience. So if you have any questions or comments, now is the time. And actually, following up on something you just said, Greg, Patricia would like to know, uh, she says, you are working, you're working as a librarian now. How did that career change happen? And what education did you need? Uh, well, it was completely unexpected. I, as I said, I was a PR person. I, it was a challenging, stressful, rewarding career. Um, once I started working in libraries, visiting them as a, someone who was using the space to work, uh, I just, I realized this is what I, where I fit. This is, this was where I could be like, the most awesome version of myself. And I, uh, I started investigating going back to school. I have, a, I, I went to the University of Alabama uh, during COVID and got my, my master's degree and uh, have just, I enjoyed it thoroughly. It, it, it's a, a real change. Uh, I, I think many of the things I learned in public relations in terms of just kind of consolidating stories and sharing those has, has been helpful. Uh, I worked mostly in technology and technology is such an important part of the library experience now. Uh, just helping people understand how to use things like Libby, how to access databases, how to access all these fantastic resources that so many people don't realize libraries have. Go and check out the, your library's databases. If you loved using academic papers when you were in school, guess what? They're available for free through your public library. Check them out. So my route was accidental and just a wonderful one.
Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, let me give you some comments here, Greg. Um, Lucy says, I'm a retired librarian. One library I worked at had a sign that said, don't be afraid to ask dumb questions, which really seemed to put people at ease. I also found that people who said I have a dumb question to ask really didn't. Uh, and then we have a great uh, question or a comment from Pat who says the Boston Public Library also offers afternoon tea in a lovely room. It's pricey, but perfect for a special occasion. It is true. That tea room is really nice. I, I, uh, I was able to go and have uh, tea there one day and meet with the fellow who actually put together the, the cocktail lounge and um, and was responsible for the tea room. It was, it's gorgeous, but it is pricey. So uh, you have a little friendly competition, Greg. Uh, Kerry says, thank you. I loved following your library tour as my son and I have done our own library tour since the fall of 2021. Uh, she says, your tips have been helpful. Uh, she, she and her son just visited their 61st library and it was a big one the Library of Congress in DC. She well, can't wait. She can't uh, wait to keep comparing libraries with you. And uh, she uh, put the link to uh, her map of visited libraries in the chat, which I will certainly make sure to save for you, Greg. So any do. comments on that, Greg? Uh, I love it. I wish more people would do this. And Mary, we may have been in touch, but if you haven't, please get in touch with me because I would love to talk to you about your tour, kind of compare notes and see if there's a way that we can collaborate, just enjoy the journeys we're taking together, separately, but still together. All right, so uh, Greg, I'm gonna jump into the uh, Q&A now. Um, Mariette asks, how long do you stay at a library when you visit? It varies, uh, you know, there have been times when I've stayed at a library for four or five hours. Uh, well, there are days when I go to the library to do work and I may be there for eight hours, but I'm just at a computer working. Uh, when I'm doing a library visit, uh, you know, there, yeah, there are definitely times when I'm there for the better part of a day. Uh, I was recently, a couple of years ago, I was at Greenfield where there were a, they invited me out to come as they were trying to build a new library and help um, help explain why the town deserved and needed a, a, needed a library. Um, and I spent the, the entire day uh, meeting with the library staff, with the director, their foundation and friends, uh, met with the Yes campaign, met with the Chamber of Commerce, we met with the mayor, um, really try to get a, a complete picture. And then there's other times where, you know, on Monday, I stopped by uh, four libraries associated with this talk. And I think some of them, I was only there for, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, but I would spend as much time as possible. I, I love talking to library people. So Judy uh, wants to know if you're still visiting libraries, which I believe you are. And she has an excellent suggestion for you. Uh, she recommends the Milford, New Hampshire Library. The director's philosophy is the library is the living room of the community. The creative changes the director has made over the past six years have been amazing. And she invites you to see for yourself. I would love to. I, I, I just was in October. Uh, I was in New Hampshire uh, in late May. I spoke at the New Hampshire Library Association. And visited, um, I think nine libraries. I went to a Plastow, which is the town I grew up in, um, then a Sanborn, and then Chester, and then Manchester, which was closed early, um, and then Bow, Canterbury, uh, New Hampton, where I went to school for a year, uh, and then Laconia and Meredith. Uh, so it was it was a treat, and I would love to come and see Milford. Um, so thank you for the suggestion. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. Uh, Dory would like to know, uh, have you gone international? Have you visited any libraries in foreign countries yet? Uh, I personally have not. 
Um, you know, this project really started in earnest in 2018. Um, it got sidetracked by the pandemic. I'm, I'm hoping to, to change that. Uh, I've certainly talked to librarians um, and explored libraries virtually in other parts of the world, but not in person at this point. Uh, so uh, Peggy has a question. It's a little bit of a tough question for you. These aren't all going to be softballs, Greg, uh, but she uh, wants your opinion on uh, what I would classify as uh, as maybe mission creep, I guess. Uh, I mean, I'd love a social worker in my library, but um, but I, I don't I, but I can't be the social worker. And so what Peggy is saying is um, there are libraries in her area that have made the librarians take on the duties typically associated with social workers. The staff and patrons don't feel this is appropriate for a diverse public library. Any thoughts on that, Greg? Absolutely. I, you know, I, I will say that I, I worked, uh, you know, in working at Framingham, that's a community that has a lot of, where there's a lot of needs where, um, you know, people are technically oftentimes not very savvy. They're needing to access services that you know are social services, and a lot of times the, the help they need is you know simply figuring out how to to get those things. Uh, I was at a branch library in Wichita uh, in in twenty one and spoke to a librarian there who said that they during the pandemic had two to three hundred people a day coming to access public computers to access social services. Um, it is definitely, uh, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, and some libraries have put social workers in. San Francisco is among the first to recognize that as a third space, as one of the few public spaces open to everybody, they were going to need to be able to address the needs of a diverse community. And some of that diversity means people with mental health issues. It means people with, uh, with criminal backgrounds who maybe aren't able to access services elsewhere. Uh, and libraries need to be able to address the needs of those publics. They are still part of the communities that we serve. And we have to find ways to do that. I don't think that means that every librarian suddenly becomes a social worker and has to devote time to that. But we have to find ways to recognize and meet the needs of all members of our community, even if they're not the popular ones. Uh, so Carrie notes, uh, who, we, who we mentioned, who's doing the library tours with, with her son, uh, that they've visited uh, several Canadian libraries, and they especially like Quebec City's library. They say it's gorgeous. I am a uh, huge fan of Quebec City, and I can believe it. Yeah, yeah. Let's take uh, two more questions. Uh, Stephen asks, have you compiled statistics about your library survey, and are they available on your website? I'm working on it. So... Uh, you will on the website you'll you'll find uh, sketches, descriptions, writings, and observations about libraries. Uh, when I went to library school, you know I had those uh, I had our criteria that I was trying to use to rate libraries. That was going to be my master's thesis. I tried to make it objective. I created this huge thing in, in Qualtrics. It was it was a nightmare, uh, and I realized that. There are people already who are doing quantified data around libraries. It's data I don't think is necessarily valuable. Um, I think that qualitative data, the narrative stories of what makes libraries important to the people and the communities they serve uh, is, is more important. And I'm working right now on trying to take the qualitative data that I've been collecting and that I'm collecting through um, through surveys and through the four questions and the framework and attach quantifiable metrics to those so that we can start saying, all right, let's take these, these nice stories and start thinking about what can be measured in them. And so I've been using, I use different tools to do sentiment analysis, word frequency analysis, um, understanding tonality. It, it's been really, it's been interesting. And if, uh, Stephen, if you have ideas on how to do that, I'd love to talk to you. So before we get to our last question, and it's a very important and relevant question for today's times, uh, let me give you a few more really nice comments from the chat. Uh, David says, I camp all around the country and I spend time in libraries whenever we have a rainy day. 
I recently spent a lovely rainy day in the Morgantown Library in West Virginia, West Virginia and I uh, generally found libraries are very welcoming. Totally. Uh, Dory uh, says, I didn't know about the speaker or his project. Uh, I too love libraries. I started my own library project uh, back in 2021. I have visited more than 30 libraries so far, and I will continue to visit more libraries. I love the stories that uh, Greg told tonight. Dory, uh, Martha, get in touch with me. Yeah, so Dory, reach, reach out to Greg. Uh, Martha says, uh, the library book by Susan Orlean is a great story with incredible detail about the LA Public Library. Have you, have you read that one yet, Greg? I have. I have. I enjoyed it very much. Pretty good one. Uh, Mariette says, last year, my husband and I visited dozens of libraries throughout Rhode Island and Massachusetts to admire the architecture, especially the Carnegie Libraries. And one of Mariette's hobbies is she collects library bookmarks. I would say, right. you know, Mariette, look at some contemporary libraries and see if you can find architects you like. And one of my one of my favorite architectural firms for libraries is Odin Zello. Uh, they did the, the Webster Library, uh, which when we when I still rated libraries was the first and only and last to get a perfect score. It was just amazing. Um, but then I learned they did the Mills Public Library right down the street from me. I live in Medway and I sought that one out. And then they did the East Ham Library uh, and Norwell. And so if you find a library, architects you like, it's really, it's a lot of fun to go see different examples of their work and how they've uh, adapted uh, their thinking to different communities, to different footprints. Um, it's a really rich area to, to explore and enjoy. All right, so final question, and I, I do realize we're in overtime here, and I want to apologize for Dory, uh, Stephen, and Judy for not getting to all of your questions, but our final question tonight comes from an anonymous attendee who writes, wonderful presentation. Uh, what are your thoughts on how can we counter the movement to defund libraries because of acquiring materials accessible to diverse populations? So Greg, your thoughts on uh, the movement to defund libraries and, and what patrons can do about it. Get involved. I became a library trustee because I want my town to have an outstanding library. I wanna make sure that, um, that somebody who spends a, a disordered amount of my time thinking about libraries, that I could be part of solving and considering the challenges that libraries face. Go to your library trustees meetings. Make sure that you don't let a vocal minority, uh, and that's what's happening. You know, some of these book bans, there's a handful of people who are propagating them across the country. Uh, be present, be part of the community, be, put your voice to, pr to protect your library and to make sure that the, the trustees, the administration and the staff know that you value those things uh, so that you can be a counterbalance and be an active participant, really. That's the most important thing you can do. So Greg, I think we're gonna wrap it there. Uh, I'll just say a few words and then I'll kick it back to you in case you have any closing remarks. But uh, for the folks who are watching live, uh, look for that email for me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey and information about some other upcoming virtual programs that might be of interest to you. I again wanna thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, wanna thank the libraries in Andover, North Reading, Woburn, Gorica, and Wilmington for, for uh, helping spread the word. And uh, Greg, any, any last words? I, I just invite you all to, to be library travelers, to, to come to library land. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful and it's a, an inspiring, fun and amazing place. All right, well, thanks so much, Greg, wonderful job. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Thanks again. Thank you very much.